Hey, well, it's good to be with you here this morning. Isn't it neat that even though I can't be with you, I can be with you, that, that while the building is closed, the church isn't. Oh, I think I love that, 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 because the church never closes. The church is the people that makes it up, and, uh, and we're open for business 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. Um, look, I'm going to start off uh, with a, just showing you a photo that I took a couple of weeks ago. It's a photo of a couple of cherry trees from sort of halfway up the hill in Dunedin, looking out towards the Pacific Ocean. Lovely aspect. But the interesting thing about this photo is that there's something really odd in it. This is right at the start of August. I think it was the 1st of August. It was somewhere around then. And the trees have got cherry, have got, the cherry trees have got blossoms on them. Now the 1st of August is right at the, pretty much the middle of winter. Cherry trees should not have blossoms on them in the middle of winter. They flower in spring. Now, late August, early September, all of the Dean glows pink and white with all the cherry trees coming off. It's it's incredible scene. It's well worth coming down here for at some point to see the cherry trees. But um, they don't come out in, at the start of August. It's That's odd. It's unusual. Not having any flowers is normal for a cherry tree in winter. But not having any flowers is abnormal for a cherry tree in September. Whether or not it's normal or not depends on the situation that the tree finds itself in. These trees were abnormal because they were expected to be barren and instead they had flowers. Later on, a tree that's expected to have flowers and was barren, that would be the abnormal one. And that's really the, the point that I'm wanting to break, bring this morning in this message. I'm going to pray quickly and then I'm going to get into it. Father, thank you so much that you give me the privilege of speaking your words to your people. And, and I, I thank you, Lord, that they are your words and your people. Uh, Lord, as I speak, I pray that you would fill my words with your breath and your word, with your, your presence that as I'm speaking, people would be hearing not just from me, but also from you. I pray also that everyone that hears this message would hear an individual message just for them. That as many people hear this, that's how many messages would be heard. Lord, that you would speak something significant and individual to each person that hears it. I ask that in your mighty name, Lord. Amen. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. This is just an amazing verse. And this is the, the, the verse for this whole message comes out of this. All right? Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone and the new has come. Or in the, the King James, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I, I kind of like that. Behold, the new has come. The old things have passed away. They're gone. The old's gone. The new has come. That's an exciting verse because it's actually in some ways the whole point of the Bible is it starts off by telling us about the law and about how things used to be and about what used to happen. And then the center point of history came, Jesus Christ. And when he died, he made it possible for us to enter into the new has come, to enter into the life with Christ, the life through Christ, the, the true life, life that we can have only in Christ. And so what I'm going to talk about today is about discovering and learning to live in the new normal that there is a new normal that we can live in and that we need to learn how to do that because as we adapt to the new normal, that's when we have the new life, the resurrection life that comes through Christ. See, adapting to a new normal is something that we all deal with in real life, in normal life, um, in everyday life. In, for, uh, for me, one of the, the biggest times that I had to adapt is when I was 34, I was single with no real prospect of of being anything other than single. Uh, I was living in the basement of a place in Avondale, close to the water, nice place. I enjoyed it. I was at a church that I enjoyed. I had a home group that I liked. Um, everything was set up. I liked my job. Everything was set up around things that I enjoyed doing. I, My whole life was set up around, I had time to do pretty much whatever I wanted, and so I did it. I was involved in coaching cricket. I was involved in rugby league. I I watched sport and I, and I did lots of writing and it was fun. It was a great time. 
there was the times of loneliness in there, but it was a good time. But that was what my normal was. My normal was living for myself. And, and I was trying to use it to be productive and I'd share the gospel with people and I'd, I'd speak occasionally and I, I went to Bangladesh and did some mission stuff. All of that good stuff was great. But it was really life that was lived around my needs and wants and, 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 and about me living my life. And, and, and that was the season I was in. Jump forward three years when I'm 37. And uh, now I'm living in Dunedin, married with three children. It happened very quickly. Um, and, and I had to adapt to a new normal. I had to adapt to a normal where I no longer went out with my mates because I, my world got smaller. I no longer... Uh, sat and played computer games until late at night. It just didn't, I didn't have time for that or energy for that because I had three little children I was looking after. Um, my job was now no longer as, as much of a priority. It was now about, I was doing my job for my family rather than doing the job for me. My, my attitude to things changed and I had to adapt to a new normal, to a new way of things being. And, and we have to do that all the time. Things change in our lives and we have to adapt to it. But just like we have to adapt to that, as we come into Christ, everything changes. In some ways, someone who's new to Christ from a Christian background is actually needs to be as thoroughly converted as someone who's come from an atheist or a Muslim or, or a Mormon or anything else background. The difference between walking in a religious experience of of the of Christianity versus the actual reality of of encountering God and living with Him is as radically different as walking away and walking towards, and, and we need to be as thoroughly converted. Now, and now, what I'm saying there is that actually the old has gone and the new is come, and we have to learn to live in that new normal. See, Peter, the great apostle. Walked with Jesus for three years, and then on the day of the crucifixion, this guy had been living right with Jesus. They'd, they'd been staying together. They, he'd been taking him up to pray. He'd seen the Mount Transfiguration. This is this is the guy who is Jesus' number one hope on the planet. And on the day of resur of the crucifixion, he denies Christ, and then denies Christ again, and then denies Christ a third time. Because there was something in him that was not prepared to say, I die in order that he might live. But, jump forward a few chapters, Acts chapter 2, Peter gets filled with the Holy Spirit. What does he do? He stands up in front of the crowd. The same crowd that said, save Barabbas and kill Jesus. The same crowd that called for his blood. Hostile to the message. And he preaches boldly, proclaims the truth. Acts chapter 5, he stands before the Sanhedrin. And even though they, they tell him, don't speak any more of this, he says to the, the, the Sanhedrin, the, effectively the parliament of its day, the religious council, and he says, I don't care what you say. I'm following the Lord. You can tell me not to preach. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to keep preaching. These men have the power to put him to death, and he just openly defies them. The change from the before the Holy Spirit to the after the Holy Spirit is a complete 180 turnaround. It's from someone who's not wanting to even be associated with Jesus to someone who says, I don't care if you kill me, I'm following him. See, he'd adapted to a new normal. He'd gone from being himself who knew about Jesus to someone who was walking completely in Christ. That's why when he walked past people and they could get healed by a shadow, it, it wasn't the shadow of Peter, it was the shadow of the one he was walking in that he did the healing. All right. Now, for me, this is a really important message because this is like a really big part of, of my lived experience of Christianity. You see, I was born with or, or developed at a young age, we're not really sure, a, a medical condition that was described by the doctors as terminal and degenerative. That's something that gets worse and worse and worse until you die. Now, what it was is that there were signals that would go from my brain to my body and back that didn't always get through. Now, that, that's not uncommon. Lots of people have that. Um, genetically, some, some nerves just don't work. Like, some people can roll their tongues. Some people can't roll their tongues. Some people can wiggle their ears. 
I'm one of those people that can't wiggle their ears. I, that nerve is not connected for me. Now that's normal. And it's also normal developmentally that people's nerves develop and they have, and some things that you couldn't do, you can do later on. What's not normal, however, is that the nerves stop working for someone while they're young. It happens as people are, get older, but it certainly doesn't happen while people are young. And what was happening is instead of um, my nerves, there are some things like, for example, kids often can't tell that they need to go to the toilet until uh, it's too late. And as they get to about two years old, that nerve starts to kick in and they start being able to be aware that they need to go to the toilet. And, and it's until that nerve connection to the brain is made, they can't tell that. But it does get made and then they're able to tell. Now the problem for me was those connections were breaking down. That more and more, less of my nerves were working rather than more of them were working. And so that turned out to be quite serious. The, my dad didn't actually tell me this at the time, but the a neurosurgeon took him aside and said, hey, look, this is the story here. Um, as far as we're aware, no one's lived past 18 who's had this happen when they're young. This is quite a serious thing. And at about that point, dad decided that he was going to stop doing the tests on me, getting the tests done on me, and say, let's just enjoy living. Uh, you see, because... I'd had a, a lot of medical tests. I'd had, um, at one point I added up, there were over 3,000 images of me taken through through CAT scans and MRIs and X-rays and um, a really nasty one where they um, tested out my bladder strength by pushing something up there, which you don't really want to go there. Um, but uh, the one, one of the really cool ones I had was a thing called a myelogram. I think I've got that right. A myelogram, and that's where they inject radioactive isotopes into your back, and then you've got to lie on a certain angle so the radioactive stuff doesn't get to your head, and you lie on the angle, and they X-ray you, or use a special type of X-ray to watch the radioactive things moving up and down your nervous system, and um, and then it passes out through your urine. So I had to go to the toilet in a special toilet that was like a radioactive protected zone um, because like where I peed it was like seriously dangerous for other people to be around um, and uh, so for a three days I was in like isolation it was it was pretty cool actually um, it took a couple of attempts because your blood pressure has got to be like really consistent and the first time I went in there my blood pressure wasn't consistent enough and so I had to go away for a, a, a three weeks and then come back and have another go and I was really upset because I missed out on a cricket game. And I really enjoyed cricket, which uh, for some reason I was never any good at it. Um, but in fact, uh, when I was coaching cricket, the guy that I was the head coach, uh, you know, I told him that I was a pretty average cricketer and he, he and that I, you know, I wasn't coming in with any background and personal ability. And he had a chat to a guy who'd been my coach and said, oh, look, you know, was he just being modest when he said he was an average cricketer? And Rex uh, said, if he said he was an average cricketer, he was certainly not being modest. Uh, he was nowhere near as good as an average cricketer. <laughs> he was well below that. And, and Rex was telling the truth. I was absolutely hor horrendously bad. Um, but I enjoyed participating. And, and, you know, that's part of the joy of it. But anyway, so I had all these things. And, and what they discovered was that things were not good. In fact, I had an episode... Right, sitting on the neurosurgeon's table where I had no idea it was happening and he was looking at it and he was freaking out about the fact that I couldn't feel what was going on in my body and the main one of the main ways it used to rip uh, used to uh, be demonstrated the main one of the way, main ways it used to happen was I used to wet my pants there were other things that happened but that was the main one that was the most obvious and because I got a phantom response I wouldn't know that I'd wet my pants I couldn't feel it. I couldn't smell it. I had no idea it had happened a until someone told me. Now, you can imagine being a school student and the only way you know you'd wet your pants if someone told you. School kids aren't always very kind about how they would do that. And so it was a it was a tricky time. I, I certainly, with the bullying I got, I cried myself to sleep a number of times at night. And so I really had to learn how to manage my my condition. I couldn't 
just go on with it and let it happen. I had to learn to manage it. And we do that in everything in life. Everyone has difficulties. Everyone has things that, that, that are difficult. And we learn to manage them. We learn how to deal with that. You might not like the morning, so you set three alarms. Uh, everyone finds their own strategies for dealing with things. And for me, one of the strategies is I went to the toilet every hour. I had spare pants, two pairs of spare pants, and I wore special undies that had padding in them so that if I did wet my pants, there's not much got through. Um, and that was that was how I developed a, a ways of dealing with it. In terms of sports, I had very little coordination, so I, I learned to do things that didn't require the coordination so I could still play. When I was playing cricket, I was a terrible cricketer because you know the nerves just didn't really work properly. My muscles didn't work the way they were supposed to. So I learned to bowl spin because that didn't require running in. And so I could do that without as much difficulty. I learned to field in places where I didn't have to run and throw. Um, so I was generally a slip. Um, and and yet still sometimes things would happen. There was a cricket game. I'm sort of exaggerating this story because it's easier to understand that way. So just this is a, a, an exaggerated version of it. But I was fielding at mid-off, so standing pretty close to where the bowler ran in from. Uh, the batsman climbed the door, hit it over my head. I reached up to grab the ball, stuck in my hand. I could feel it. I had the catch. But the ball wasn't there, and everyone else was saying, oh, so close. My hand never actually closed on the ball. Instead, um, instead, I, um, I, my hand was open. And while I could feel the ball in my hand, it wasn't actually there. I never actually took the catch. And that sort of thing was, was what happened. I'd have an episode like that, and they were happening more and more frequently. But because I was getting better at managing them, they were less of, a, of an issue for my life. I'd got to the point where I was able to deal with them, but I, they were still happening. Now, when I was 10, I had another thing, as well as my, my medical condition, that wasn't, for me, the main thing that defined my life, though. For a lot of other people, it was. But for me, that wasn't what defined my life. What defined my life was something that happened when I was 10 years old. A friend of mine invited me along to a Christian camp. It was run by the Brethren at, at Totra Springs. And I went along there, and you did all the sort of things that 10-year-old boys like to do. We did archery, we did abseiling, and we, we shot air rifles, and we went kayaking, and we swam in the river, and... It was, it was great fun. It was just what you'd want from a summer holiday when you're 10 years old. It was neat. And then in the evenings, they used to share the gospel or used to, to preach us. And one particular message, I remember it really clearly. The guy's name was preaching was Bryce. And he spoke just a really clear gospel message. He said, if you've got sin in your life, you need to get it removed. And you can only get it removed by being born again. You've got to get born again. And he went through scripturally how that happens, how you got to get moving. He said, it doesn't matter if you if you call yourself a Christian. It doesn't matter if you go to church. It doesn't matter if your name's Christian. It doesn't matter if you go to a Christian school. It doesn't matter if your parents are Christian. All that matters, as far as God concerns, is have you been born again and had your sins taken away? And you know, there was something in me I thought, that's not me. I haven't had that happen. I need it. And then at the end of the wonderful gospel message, he gave the worst altar call in history. And he said, right, there's supper out the back. There's Milo and chocolate biscuits for everyone. Uh, unless you want to stay and give your life to Jesus and get born again. And if you do, just stay in your seat. And so pretty much everyone left the, the hall. And there was a few of us stayed behind, though. And I, I sat in my seat. And the guy that was sitting beside me, he was my friend that invited me. Uh, he tried to get past me, and he said, well, what are you doing? You know, I said, I've got, to, I've got to do this. And he said, well, if you've got to do this, I've got to do it too. And he sat down, and we went, got taken over to the little chapel and prayed the sinner's prayer. Tears ran down my face. I remember just crying and crying and crying. I didn't know that I was a sinner, really. I, I, I kind of knew that I'd done some things wrong, but I, I sort of had compared myself to everyone else and thought I was doing all right. <laughs> but I didn't realize the standard was perfection. You see, and all of a sudden, once I got set free from that, I really did. I felt free. There was a freedom that I felt. I remember it vividly. And I remember where I was sitting in the little room. I remember that the, the, the almost, I can almost smell the carpet that they had there. 
Um, and I remember it so clearly that just tears running down my face. And I remember thinking, I used to believe in God, but now I know God. And I, I remember that sense of freedom. And I also remember thinking, why didn't anyone tell me this before? Now, the fact is, I think a lot of people have told me that before. And my dad was an evangelist. I'm sure that I heard him preach the gospel a number of times when I'd heard him speaking. I actually could remember later on times where I'd heard the message and responded to it and prayed the sinner's prayer. But this was the time where it really, there was a transaction inside. And I don't know what the difference was in this time than the other times, but this time there was something in my heart that made that connection. And I was now in Christ. The old was gone and the new had come. And because I had that experience of being set free on the inside, it made sense to me that God would want to set me free on the outside. That my medical condition was not going to be the thing that defined my life. In fact, my relationship with God would be. And so when I was 11, uh, a miracle happened. My dad let me have a day off school, or at least an hour off school. And we went to visit Bill Sabritsky uh, to get Bill to pray for me. Now, Bill was a sort of, he was my grandfather's cousin. And so, and they were sort of two of the, there was only a few of them in, in Auckland. The rest of them were in the far north. And so they got on quite well and their families knew each other. And so dad grew up around the Sabritskys. They used to go skiing together. And, and so we'd been around to Bill's place for a barbecue before, but this time I was going around there to get him to pray for me. And he was a little bit scary. He's pretty, he was pretty intense. And when you're 11 and not really experienced with this sort of stuff, my experience of Christianity was the brethren camps, really. I'd been to churches, but this was, um, I hadn't really got it before. Now I got it, but oh, it was, he was a bit odd, a bit scary. But as we were leaving, I felt the Lord tell me, you will be healed when you're 16. Now, for me, I took that, that by the time I was 16, I would be healed. That the day I turned 16, that's it, I'd be healed. And so I was pretty excited about this. I was pretty excited by about what the fact that I was going to be healed and that could happen any day now. It certainly would happen by the time I was 16. And, and Dad taught me to pray, say, God, thank you for healing me. And so I was praying in faith, thank you for healing me. I'd pray regularly, three or four times a week, thank you, Lord, for healing me. Thank you, Lord, for healing me. And 11, I didn't get healed. 12, I didn't get healed. 13, I didn't get healed. 14, I didn't get healed. I started reading books about healing and about how God heals and what the Bible says about it. And it was clear that God heals. There was testimonies of people who had been healed. There was, there was scriptural evidence of the fact that God heals and that God heals today. And I was convinced, and yet I hadn't been healed. And people talk to me about, about maybe your healing is just that, that you're going to get up to like the very bottom of the bell curve. You know, there's the, the normal uh, nervous system reaction. And maybe instead of being right down off normal, you're going to get up into the point where it's normal. And it didn't sit right with me because the new wine was better than the old wine. When Jesus turned the water into wine, the new wine was better than the old wine. He didn't, he didn't make cheap wine. He made good stuff. And I didn't think it would be just adequate. A just adequate healing didn't seem like God's character to me. And so I believed for a healing. When I was 15, the power of God fell dramatically in our church. The, the Toronto blessing or the Father's renewal or, or, or whatever you want to want to call that move that, had, that sort of started at Toronto Airport Church. Uh, and, and it hit our church in a really dramatic way. We went from having about 60 people on a really good night in the evening service to having three or four hundred and having people sitting on the floor, sitting in the foyer of the church, standing around outside the door listening in. Um, and we saw miraculous things. People would just get prayed for to be touched by the Holy Spirit. And when they did, their lives would be transformed. People that had been going to counseling for years had the issues dealt with in seconds, uh, lying on the floor at that, at that place. We saw hundreds of people had their lives transformed. And we had older calls for healing and lots of people would get healed and I didn't. And I had the faith. I knew God would heal me. I knew it was going to happen and it just never did. But I got pretty excited because we got close to the, my 16th birthday and I thought any day now. 
I wasn't worried because I thought you know, he was going to heal me when I was 16. I was, by the time I turned 16, I was going to wake up at 16 and be healed. And I can't remember if it was on my 16th birthday or the day after or the day after that, but it was fairly soon after I had another incident. And I didn't know what to make of it. It's clear that I wasn't healed. How did this happen? How did God let that happen? How could I be not healed when he told me I'd be healed and his word said I'd be healed and all these other people have been healed? How come I wasn't? Had I just made the whole God thing up? Had I just misunderstood who he was? And I had some stuff to deal with. I didn't want to come out of my room for two weeks. I didn't want to see anyone. I didn't. Well, other people were so excited about being 16. I, I wasn't really. The prospect of going to an R16 movie wasn't really that exciting when I wasn't healed. And I, I just didn't know what to make of it. So I, I processed it. I took, a, I remember one day I went for a walk out by my parents' place. There's a little bush. I went up, walked up through there. And I was just praying, Lord, what's going on? And I, 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 I didn't hear anything. But I thought about it and I thought, I can't deny what happened to me when I was 10. That was such a profound experience that, that I was so far beyond what I was expecting that, that there's no way I made that up. And I can't deny the love that I've seen God pouring out since then and the experiences I've had with him. I can't deny that. And I can't deny that he's real. I can't deny that his word is true. It just, it just seems true. I just can't believe that it's not true. And I, I believe that he heals. So I'm stuck with this position saying, I believe all these things, but it hasn't happened. And I said to the Lord, I believe that you're going to heal me. I continue to believe. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I believe that you're going to do it. And, and thank you for that. But I don't want to go up to any more healing of course. I'm not going to go up to those anymore. I'm not going to set myself up for the disappointment any longer. Fortunately, I didn't have to. Because a couple of weeks later, a, a second miracle occurred. That allowed me to have a whole day off school. Now, you've got to understand that, that, that both of my parents were teachers. And so missing school was something they were really not keen on. I could have the black death and I'd say, well, maybe you'd be all right to go today and maybe have the day off tomorrow. Yet this was, I didn't get time off school. And to be given a whole day off on a Friday to go to a Christian conference and hear a speaker that I was really looking forward to hearing. I mean, that was wonderful. Um, so I, get, I got to go along to the Catch the Fire conference at the Victory Center in town. That we used to, it's... It was AAOG at the time. I think it's now the Victory Victory Center. Um, it was so exciting. And the cool thing was, the guy that was speaking was a guy that had been staying at our house because Dad had gone over to Toronto and he made friends with people as he managed to do. And so when the guys came from Toronto over to New Zealand, they wanted to stay with us. So we had one of the pastors of the church, Mark, was staying at our place. Uh, and that was awesome. And so we had these great conversations in the morning and in the evening. This guy was a really interesting guy. I really wanted to hear him preach. And he was doing the Friday morning session because obviously he wasn't the big name. You, know, you don't give the big name the Friday morning. Um, so um, so we were there. I was sitting in the, the seat over sort of from the stage. I was just over to the left, sort of about a third of the way from the, the wall, a um, couple of tiers back, sitting there in those sort of seats they had with the fold down bits. I was sitting on there and... They had the worship, and we, we sang along with the worship. It was quite good, but not great, but it was quite good. We got into it, it was, it was fun, and I enjoyed that. And there was a nice presence of the Lord there. It was, it was, it was neat. And I was really enjoying the conference. I'd been along most evenings, and, um, and it was just so exciting what God was doing in those days. And, and so I was sitting there, sat down, ready for the preacher to get up. He walked up on the stage put his Bible and his notes down on the lectern, held both sides of it, burst out laughing and collapsed onto the ground. 
when you're in the crowd and the pastor or the preacher is lying on the ground laughing, it sort of creates an awkward moment where you don't really know what to do. How long do you wait before you everyone starts murmuring and a minute, 30 seconds? That's, it's, it's not very long before people start going, what's happening up there? What's going on? And so there's this murmuring and, and muttering happening and the pastor of the church, Max Lee, gets up and says, come on band, come up and let's do another song. And so they, let's play that song again. And then let's play that song again. And about four times, let's play that song again because the guy's still lying on the floor, laughing uncontrollably, unable to speak. And Bill Sabritsky jumps up on the stage and Max and Bill are praying and prophesying from the stage. The power of God's going to fall over there. Everyone there falls over. The power of God's going to fall over there. Everyone starts laughing in that section. The power of God's going to fall over there. Everyone there starts crying. And then I think it was Bill pointed to where I was. said, the power of God's going to fall over there. And everyone fell over except me. I mean, there may have been some others that didn't fall over, but I couldn't see them. I said, what happened, God? You missed. You know, <laughs> I closed my eyes to sort of inquire what was happening. And apparently at that time, Carol Arnott came over and prayed for me. I've got no memory of that whatsoever. I've, but Dad was, Dad swore black and blue that that, that, that was how I got healed when, when Carol Arnott came and prayed for me. So I'll, I'll believe him. He's not going to lie on that. Um, but I, what I remember is as I closed my eyes, I saw myself. You know, they've got all the stage lights and stuff. And when you close your eyes, you can sort of see all the squiggles and all of the um, the, the remnants of the lights. And it was like that, but that suddenly formed into a picture of me. And I was sort of sitting up over here looking at myself. And it's like, I haven't seen myself from that angle before. Um, and, and But I didn't look like me because I could see through my skin and I could see my nervous system. And it was like bits of fiber optic cable with lights bouncing up and down them. And those were the messages. And in my head, around about here in my neck, was a brick wall. And some of the messages were hitting the brick wall and some of them were getting through. About 70% or maybe more than that were getting through, but there were still some that were hitting the brick wall. And then I saw the outline of some hands and I felt the hands go into the back of my neck. Just like how you feel someone at the dent with the dentist doing work and there's no pain, but you can feel it happening. It was just like that. I felt it like my head, my back of my head was numb and I felt these hands go in and pull apart the, the cable and join them up. And then the picture changed to a filing cabinet. And the filing cabinet opened, something got taken from the front and put to the back and the filing cabinet got closed. And you see what was happening at that point is the old was going and the new was coming. Because from that point on, I was completely and totally healed. I never again had another episode of the, the brain and body not working together. Now it's just my brain and my mouth that don't work together. <laughs> um, but I was completely and totally healed at that point. And what I had to do is I had to learn a new way of living, a new normal. You see, for before... The normal for me was to, uh, the, sorry, before, the normal to me was that I needed to change my pants every night because I'd wet them every day. And that was, how do I know I need to do the laundry? Because it's a day, ending in Y. Therefore, I need to get my pants to the laundry. Now, I had to actually wait until I, they needed washing, not just because it was the end of the day and I washed them. I had to learn that. At 16, whereas most people learn that when they're 7 or 8 or whatever. I had to learn that at 16. I, I had to learn a whole lot of different life skills because I no longer needed to, for example, go to the toilet every hour. You know, that was no longer a need for me. And so I needed to learn to adapt to a new normal. And I, and I was able to learn to adapt to a new normal. Um, I had a reader writer because of my bad coordination for my exams. I now felt like I wasn't, it wasn't fair to ask for one because my coordination, I no longer had a problem. So my final year exams, I didn't have a writer. And I had to learn how to write quickly enough to be able to sit my exams. Most other people learned that at school. See, I had to learn it for bursary. And I, I, I failed English because I ran out of time. I didn't finish the exam. Um, 
I also failed it because I didn't do enough study throughout the year. That had, had a lot to do with it also. But if I had have finished the exam, I probably would have passed. But I just couldn't write fast enough um, because I hadn't yet learned to walk in the new normal. Um, but as I learned to walk in the new normal of everyday things, I also started to discover that as I started to share my testimony, and I didn't tell anyone about it for four years because I was still really embarrassed about the fact that I used to wet my pants and what used to happen. I didn't want anyone to know. Four years later, it didn't matter so much to me. I was quite prepared to let people know and it didn't worry me too much what they thought anyway. Um, four years later, I started sharing my story and the second I started sharing it, I started seeing miracles break out. I saw some really cool things. I saw a guy who was uh, deaf in one ear and I prayed for him. He was one of the leaders at a camp that I was there helping out as a sound tech. Um, I prayed for him. His ear immediately healed. He could hear instantly through that ear. And something phenomenal happened. I, he ended up getting me to pray for a whole lot of people at that camp. We saw some other cool miracles happen there. Um, one Sunday morning, there was a young guy turned up to church and he had broken his collarbone at rugby on the um on the Saturday and um I asked if I could pray for him he said yes but somewhat skeptically um I, I put my hand on his shoulder and I said all right move your shoulder move, as I prayed I said move your shoulder around and he, he moved it around I could feel the bones going like this I thought that's not very good <laughs> they're not supposed to do that but then all of a sudden as I was praying they went like that and they stayed and his shoulder was completely healed the collarbone was back in one piece. Broken on the Saturday, healed on the Sunday morning, sharing his testimony on the Sunday night. What a wonderful story. And I saw lots of things. I saw someone, I saw someone get healed of, of bad sunburn. I had uh, people with sprained knee getting healed. I had um, uh, someone who was blind in one eye and deaf in one ear get healed. I, I had some wonderful healings. And I started to learn that this was the new normal. That this is what it means to walk in Christ, to imitate Christ, that, that signs and wonders will follow those that believe. I started walking in that. And it's because I was now in the normal of the normal through Christ, not the normal without him. And when I hear someone say, well, everyone does it like this, when they're talking about um, oh, yeah, an example of... of uh, sex before marriage. Well, everyone does it. Well, no. Everyone does it who's living by the world's normal, not by the Lord's normal. Everyone does it who's living according to the way the world says is normal, not according to what God says is normal. You see, once we start walking according to his normal, we start seeing supernatural power, but we also start seeing the supernatural power live a holy life. And as we walk, learn to walk in that normal, we actually have to learn that there are some things that we do differently. There are some things that we do that are not the same as what we used to do. See, Peter had to learn to share the gospel with power because before he'd been timid, he learned that there were different ways of him living because of who he was in Christ. He learned that. Paul, when he got converted uh, from Saul to Paul and had the Damascus Road experience, he actually went away, you can find the scripture, he went away and spent some time really studying the scriptures and really trying to understand it. There's some indication he may have actually gone to Mount Sinai to do it, which is kind of cool. Um, if you if you read through, there's, there's, there's a couple of clues in, in his letters that, that suggest that's where he went, um, which is kind of awesome if it is. I, I like to think that's where he went because I, I kind of like that mystic idea of Paul. Um, a, a lot of people prefer to think of him just as a scholar, but I, I like him to be a scholar and a mystic. Um, and Jesus demonstrated the, the new normal when he was at the wedding and he turned the water into wine. It wasn't, you know, people sort of have this idea that miracles are only to happen to serve the gospel. Well, no. There was a need and so Jesus filled it. I don't think that happens all the time, but there is a time where he would, that was walking in normal for him was to deal with the problem. Um, and later he demonstrated the, uh, the complete superiority of the new normal, the, the resurrection life over the, over the earth when he walked through the locked door. 
just the same way as we can walk through water. We can only walk through it because we're more solid than the water. If the water was more solid than us, we couldn't walk through it. But because we're more solid than the water, we can walk through the water. Jesus could walk through a locked door because he was more solid. He had more substance than that locked door. He was walking in a higher dimension, not in a lower dimension. And I think that's kind of cool. You see, Elisha, when his servant came to him and said, the, the enemies are around us, they're surrounding us, they're going to, what are we going to do? He had to open the eyes of his servant to what the real normal was. He said to his servant, there is more with us than against us. And he opened his eyes to the, the servant's eyes and he could see all of the angels. And Elijah, Elisha walked out of that situation unscathed because the armies of God protected him. See, I heard a really neat story one day, and I don't know if I've got all the details of this right. I don't care. I love this story anyway. Um, I heard it on the radio on, I think it might have been while I was working in the ice cream factory and they had more FM on. And uh, I used to clean and I'd be a cleaner in an ice cream factory and the radio was always on. And there used to be the same jokes repeated over and over again. Um, because I expected that the people only listened to it in their car. So if you listen to it for three or four hours, you heard the same things a few times. But I heard this story once, and this was an awesome story. It was about a zoo in Thailand where they had a tiger cub born, and they did an experiment, and I think it had been rejected by its mother. I'm, I'm not sure. It was, it was a little one. They did an experiment where they put it and a piglet and a puppy, who were all born about the same time together, to see how they interact you know would the tiger eat the pig yeah you know, what was going to happen and it turned out the pig actually grew faster than the, the puppy or the or the uh tiger cub and was more aggressive than either of them early on and so the pig became the boss it was the top of the pecking order then the dog then the tiger now a year in the tiger's now bigger than the pig and the dog put together and fiercer than either of them, if there was a fight, that was certainly going to be the one to win. Yet, it was so in chains in its mind because of how things had started that it was still subservient to the dog and the pig. And the dog was still subservient to the pig. The pecking order hadn't changed, even though the reality had changed. They were still living in the old reality, the old normal. They hadn't adapted to the new normal. I'm going to have a look at a couple of verses here. Um, 1 Peter 1, 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. See, when we're born again, there's something in us that's imperishable. It, it can't be taken away. The, the, there's something in us that's so strong that we can't. it can't be denied. And we live uh, not in the fallen world that's dying. And constantly getting worse. But we live in the imperishable world. The world of Eden. That we're under the second Adam. Not under the first Adam. And we no longer are subject to the decay. Now instead the kingdom of heaven is forcefully advancing. It, it, let's, let's have a look. There's another verse here. Second Corinthians 3, 17, uh, or 16 Corinthians 3.17. Or 16 onwards. Let's have a look. Nevertheless when one turns to the Lord. The veil is taken away. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, or there is freedom, another translation. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. There's heaps of that little verse. I'm going to unpack that quickly for us. All right. The veil was torn when Jesus died on the cross. The veil was torn in the Holy of Holies that we now had access to the presence of God. We're given freedom to walk above the ways of the world, to walk in the new normal through Christ. That's why where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But now with the unveiled face, we can behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We can see him, not directly, but we can get, a, get an image of him. And as that happens, we get transformed into the same image. We get transformed into the likeness of Christ. 
We become imitators of Christ. That's why Paul could say, imitate me as I imitate Christ, because he was going through this, this journey of becoming more like Christ. And it's through the Spirit, but we move from glory to glory. Isn't that a wonderful passage? I, I think that's amazing. And the key to how it happens, we see Paul gives us in Philippians chapter 3. He starts off by talking about all of the reasons he has to boast, all the things he's done that, are, that, are, that, that set him apart from everyone else, why he was such a good Jew, why he was of the, you know, of the tribe of Benjamin and, and circumcised at the right time. And, and, and he even goes to say, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That's a big call. But he said that for everything he'd done, he'd done, made a sacrifice to make up for it. He'd covered himself. He'd done, followed the law perfectly. And yet, listen to this in verse 7. But what these things, what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the power of and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. See, Paul was learning that he was having to put to death his old life so that he could learn more and more to walk in the new life, that he could walk in the resurrection life. And he says this, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to having apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward to those which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. We press on towards the goal. We've not attained it yet. We're not walking in complete Christ-likeness yet. But we can press on. That we can know him in his sufferings. Know him in his death. That we may know him in his resurrection. And walk in that resurrection power. It is available to us. But we're still learning how to take it. And today. I'm going to give you the option. To join with me in helping to make a step closer towards it. It talked in that verse that as we behold him, we're transformed into his image. As we come into, into contact with his presence, we can be transformed into his likeness or into his image. We become more like Christ by spending time with him. I'm going to take up communion now. Now here's the advantage of preaching on YouTube. If you don't have communion elements, push pause, go and get them and come back. Right, everyone's with us. Fantastic. All right, now, as we're taking this up, there's three different groups of people that I've got a different message for today. The first, when you heard me talking about getting born again and about being in Christ, you've heard me say anything, I don't know that I am a new creation. I don't know that I have been born again. Well, today you can be. If you say, Jesus, I want you, I want to follow you, and I want a new life, he'll give it to you. He's faithful and great and, and just. You can take away your old life and give you a new one. So if, if that's you, as you take the bread and wine, pray that that wine is his blood and washes you clean, and his bread is the new life that he's giving to you. For others of you, the thing that stood out for you in this message was my story about healing. And you've got something that you need healing for. So as you take the communion, as you take the blood, you remember that, that it's by his stripes we are healed. 
And as you take the bread, remember that healing is the children's bread. You can take that bread. And I believe, and I, I honestly believe that there are three people in particular that are going to get healed as you're taking communion today. There's someone and you've got something wrong with your right leg. It's like a pain. Uh, I think it's a bone, something to do with the bone in the, in the knee of your right leg. And every time you move it, it's sore. It's particularly sore in the mornings and the evenings, but particularly in the mornings. Every morning when you get up, it's, you've got a sore right leg. As you take the communion, I believe God's going to heal you. I'd love to, I'd love you to contact me and let me know who you are, because I'd love to hear that story. But I believe someone with your right leg, particularly in your knee of your right leg, um, and it's particularly painful in the morning. It's possibly a bone issue. Uh, the good news brings health to the bones. Um, there, there's someone else, and you've got a ringing in your left ear. So that, that, these are quite specific words. I'd love to hear a story about it. Someone's got a ringing in your left ear. I believe that's going to go away as you take the, the communion. And um, the third person is a bit more generic. It's someone with a sore back. Um, but it's a specifically sore back. It's about you've got a um, uh, something to do with the vertebrae about two-thirds of the way down. Uh, and there's something to do with your vertebrae. And I believe that as you take this, the Lord's going to be healing you from that. So we just believe that. And Lord, we just ask for that. Those three miracles. So those are that's the second group of people. The first one, you're taking this and you're saying, I want to be born again. Second one, you're taking it, you're saying, I receive this healing. And, and I, I tell you what, I believe that for some of you, you've been to lots of altar calls and haven't been healed. I've been to lots of altar calls and haven't been healed. But it, God had his timing. And, I, and I've seen a lot of people who've been to lots of altar calls, haven't been healed, hear my story and think, I'll give it one more try. And God heals them. I'd love it for you if this was your one more try. And maybe God does it today. The, the third one that I want to talk about is those of you who maybe you don't have a specific need for healing. You know that you're walking in Christ, but you just want to be walking more Christ-like. You've, you want to get a better revelation of what the new normal is for you in your situation. What new normal looks like now. And as you take this, I just pray that you're going to get filled with his presence. Because when you're in his presence, that when, that's when things become available. That's when you when become aware of what the new normal is for you right now. And what level of normality God's wanting to bring into your life. The, the point where you move from being like the, uh, the, the, the there's, there's a blossoming for some of you in your cherry trees in the winter. That even when it looks like when everyone else isn't blossoming, you will be. And there's, some, there's a new normal. You're operating in a different normal to everyone around you. That's what you want. That's what I want. So as we take that, that's what I'm going to be praying for for myself. That his presence would fill me to a point where I would be experiencing a new level of normal. Getting into a closer uh, degree of normal. That I'd be starting to know more of Christ in his resurrection power. And so as we take this, I'm going to break the bread now. And I'm just going to say, Lord, I believe that you've got specific things that you're wanting to do with specific people. But generally, I know that you want to pour out your presence on everyone that's hungry. And you want to pour out your spirit on all flesh. And that includes all of us. And so long as we take this, this bread, the symbol of your body. And the wine, the symbol of your blood. And we receive your presence. Lord, for those people that are being healed right now, thank you so much. As they're hearing this message, Lord, I, I thank you that, that your, your hand is not, your arm is not too short to heal. That, that you're able to, to touch even across continents across the world next door nowhere is too far or too close thank you lord for that for those people that this are doing this they're giving their lives to you that they're being born again i thank you so much if you're one of those you need to get in touch with a with a christian friend or someone and find out about about what this new normal is like because it's completely different to what you expect 
<laughs> One thing about God is he never, ever does things the way that we're expecting. It's normally better, sometimes more difficult, but never how you expect. And for everyone else, I just pray that God blesses you richly. Uh, and as I leave, I just want to pray a blessing on everyone that's heard this, that the Holy Spirit would be with you in your coming and your going, and that you would be in touch with the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.